And aloha, folks. Welcome to this edition of Five Questions, which is airing right here on News Radio, 830 KHVH, also at HawaiiReporter.com. And it's a pleasure to get together with uh, Calbert Young, who is the Budget and Finance Director for the State of Hawaii. First of all, aloha to you, Cal. Hey, good morning, Rick. Uh, let's go through the five questions, if you wouldn't mind. And uh, let's start with number one. The obvious question is, could you describe for us the financial health of our state? Yeah, I would say the uh, financial condition uh, for the state right now is, uh, looking forward, is improving. Um, but I'm always cautiously optimistic in saying that because it's improving from a pretty serious condition. Um, you know, Hawaii is still feeling the effects of um, a prolonged recession, um, several years of austerity measures to try and combat or keep the house in order. Um, uh, while they were necessary, uh, no doubt, they've, they've somewhat taken a toll on the overall condition of the state government and uh, the larger economy as well. So um, I think there's reasons to be optimistic looking forward. We still have several assumptions and uh, areas that we have to hope to continue to improve. The tourism industry looks like it's been performing rather strongly. Uh, you would hope that continues in light of uh, the situation uh, with world credit markets and discretionary spending, the overall economy uh, for the U.S. hasn't really improved as much. Um, so w- we have to remain hopeful there. The price of oil has somewhat uh, at least stabilized to some degree, and in the larger markets, the uh, price of crude has somewhat fallen down. So perhaps maybe there's some uh, reason to be optimistic that there will be some price abatement uh, for gasoline. And that could translate to better prices for uh, airline travel. That should help buoy the uh, tourism market. And then the construction industry, you know, the state has a plan for uh, ramping up its own infrastructure development, and I think that should help um, the future prospects for construction jobs. Now, we need a lot of things to happen before the overall financial condition of the state improves uh, to the point where everyone starts feeling it mm-hmm. uh, at their at their household. But... There is reason to be optimistic. Uh, we're talking with uh, Calbert uh, Young this morning, uh, Budget and Finance Director for the State of Hawaii, with question number one of five questions. Cal, there was a report issued uh, earlier with question number two, organization called Truth and Accounting, and says that uh, our state, in their description, is a sinkhole at this point, being one of the five states in the union that have the greatest financial challenges. And I I just want to share some statistical numbers and get your interpretation, if I could, please. Uh, They mentioned that the state of Hawaii has about $19.5 billion in assets. Uh, However, of that amount, approximately $3.9 billion uh, are accessible. But we do have receipts due to the state of approximately $15.4 billion. So it seems that we have the assets, but the liquidity is challenged, yet we do have uh, some pretty profound... Uh, bills to pay. Can you interpret this information for us, and what should we know? Yeah, the statistics for Hawaii in in, um, this particular area, the assets and receivable, actually, uh, in my opinion, is is not as significant as some of the other areas that the uh, Truth in Accounting report had Hmm. had mentioned. Um, As far as liquidity goes, the state does not have a condition where liquidity has been an issue uh, as of late. And I don't particularly think that looking forward that there is going to be a liquidity issue for the state. So the accessibility of of these assets is not as critical. Um, but I think what is more critical, uh, if I may, Rick, is that the report also identified several statistics where Hawaii is one of the worst um, states in terms of those metrics. And, and that is in the area of debt per capita, and uh, unfunded liability levels for both the state pension system and the state's uh, reti- uh, health fund system. Uh, Hawaii ranks near the bottom in terms of funding for both of those um, systems. And I'll, perhaps I, uh, I'll explain. The <clears throat> metrics for the highest debt per capita um, is, is somewhat you know, we have to understand what is included in there. Hawaii, at the state level, funds a lot of capital projects, capital projects that are not 
typical or usually funded by other states. And this is for items such as um, for school construction, mm -hmm. judiciary uh, is funded at the state level as opposed to um, you know, at some lower municipal or some county level of government. Um, so that kind of puts Hawaii in a different class, if you will. Mm -hmm. So the debt per capita area, um, you know, you have to, uh, you, these agencies and analyses have to understand and account for that uh, factor. Uh, but the pension system and the health fund ones are particularly distressing because uh, they represent a significant drag and burden on the overall state um, financial structure. Uh, Hawaii has a pension system that has a liability uh, that exceeds $7 billion, a total system uh, that's actually about three times that size in terms of overall uh, uh, liability. And then on the health fund side, it's about $14 billion in liability with no real corpus to speak of, uh, as opposed to the pension system, which does have a, you know, an asset base that is mm -hmm. invested uh, by the system to try and recover and gain some of the um, returns to hold up or to, result, to resolve the liability. There's no real such corpus um, to speak of on the health fund side. So that's the area that's the most at risk. Mm. And what it means to taxpayers is that as these obligations and these liabilities grow, uh, because there's no real corpus on one side and a diminishing corpus on the other, the, the actual obligations do not shrink. So as the corpus is tapped more for both of these funds, there will be an increasing need for government to fund on a year-to-year -year basis, those obligations, and that will uh, take away availability of funds for other programs, state programs, or it may necessitate the need to fund up uh, those programs in a greater capacity, and that's going to mean um, potentially additional uh, revenue into those funds. I uh, understand. Uh, Cal, thanks for that very much. I know that we might revisit that in just a few short moments as well. It's five questions uh, this, uh, for this edition with Calvert Young, uh, Budget and Finance Director for the State of Hawaii. Let's go to question number three, if you don't mind, Cal. And this would be uh, talking about the recent Fed activity. Uh, we've witnessed the uh, debt ceiling debate, uh, the downgrading of uh, our federal uh, credit rating by Standard & Poor's. Uh, briefly, what would be the impact or what is the impact to our state in regard to activity taking place at the federal level? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, it's been about a week now since the uh, you know, since that debt ceiling debate, and and just a few days after the S and P mm -hmm. uh, downgrade, we were actually monitoring to try and see how the credit markets and the uh, overall Fed activity would result um, to Hawaii. Uh, Thus far, it doesn't look like the debt ceiling issue has affected Hawaii's uh, credit worthiness or any of the, um, you know, our availability to access the debt market. Uh, certain states have had a uh, trickle-down effect that they were they were also subsequently downgraded. There are certain debt issues, governmental debt issues out there, and some corp private corporate debt that um, you know was also subsequently downgraded. Um, related to the to the U.S. credit downgrade, but going forward, um, we have to still be mindful that the federal activity, as a specifically rates to the debt ceiling, there's likely to be some restrictions and reductions on federal spending, mm -hmm. and Hawaii is a very is a state that has a lot of federal uh, money inflows. Uh, you know, we have a very significant military presence. Um, the Department of Defense has gets spends a good portion of its budget here in Hawaii. Um, we also, at the state government level, we also receive a lot of uh, federal funds for a number of social programs. Um, we have to wait and see uh, for a federal budget and 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 determine 
which of these programs are going to get affected, in what degree and capacity, and if there is funding reductions, this will pose the question to us uh, at the state of whether or not these programs are going to be funded up by state funds uh, to replace federal funds. Um, we've all, we're already in that mode because with the expiration of the um, ARRA funds, the you know these are the recovery funds. Uh, they mm-hmm. they basically expired uh, you know at the end of last year. Uh, this is part of the, the problem that the state has had is this question about should we be funding these programs that were uh, previously funded with federal stimulus money. Should we now be using state tax dollars to keep them going and keep them going in the capacity and the, to the degree that they were uh, previously funded? Uh, this will be just more further discussion and uh, more seriousness when you consider how this debt ceiling and the overall federal budget is going to further mm-hmm. uh, drive that question because it will mean uh, less federal spending in Hawaii, more potential. Um, state spending if taxpayers want to keep and hold on to these programs that are currently in existence. Uh, Great answer. Thank you very much for helping clarify that. I would like to move on to number four and maybe elicit uh, a response as well, and that has to do with our own uh, relationship with credit rating agencies, recently specifically with Fitch and uh, with Moody's, uh, relation to uh, GO bonds and also certificates of participation. Uh, what has been the net effect of the actions by Fitch and Moody's in recent weeks, and where are we now? Yeah, there really hasn't been any effect uh, as a result of the downgrades um, for Hawaii's debt, because we, we weren't in the market um, on issuing any new, new debt. Um, and from what we've seen in the secondary markets, the downgrades really haven't affected our outstanding debt out there. We do have to be aware, though, that the downgrades likely will have an impact on our future debt issues uh, in you know future years. So, um, downgrades typically, generally, mean that we'll have higher borrowing costs. We may have to offer higher yields to sell our debt, um, but it's it's a matter of the market at the time of the sale. So. We won't really uh, know what is the true cost of the downgrades until that time, but we should anticipate that there is going to be an effect. And it may be minor, but uh, an effect nonetheless. You know, we did uh, have the opportunity, Cal, to chat a little bit about the EUTF and the ERS. So I'd like to just get your take on a recent uh, proposal or at least declaration by the governor in regard to COFA uh, and uh, the funding by the federal government requesting for additional funding to defray the cost of uh, of Hawaii. Can you explain to us uh, briefly what our financial obligation is in regard to COFA and also what the governor would like to see the federal government do specifically from a dollar standpoint? Yes, yeah, so in the COFA area, um, we, we pay for coverage or provide coverage to um, – to COFA participants or citizens uh, through our Medicaid uh, program, so through the Quest, the state's Quest program, uh, it's estimated that just the cost of uh, providing coverage for just the COFA um, beneficiaries uh, is somewhere in the area of uh, fifteen to thirty million dollars a year. Mm. <clears throat> um, it is that is quite considerable. Uh, for the state to assume, and this amount only is projected to grow into the future. Mm-hmm. So, we would hope that the um, you know the feds recognize that the burden on Hawaii, relative to, even relative to other states, is uh, on a racial basis pretty significant because it we do have to service probably one of the larger portions or populations of um, COFA participants. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we just want to you know, um, try and get the federal government to recognize that it is a obligation and a promise made, but it's a very big burden to expect a state to provide that obligation uh, without any significant federal support uh, when it is the fed, federal government that actually made that promise. So right. um, 
that's where we're just we're just trying to get additional coverage to help alleviate some of the uh, current costs and the and the prospective growing costs in that area. I uh, appreciate the uh, response on that one, uh, Cal. I do indeed. COFA, by the way, Compact of a Free Association, again, uh, with remuneration for folks from Micronesia and other areas. Um, and the federal government, again, responsible because of the entry into that treaty. Listen, I, Cal, I want to thank you so very much. Um, I hope you'll come on the program with us again in the future. We appreciate the information today, and uh, we'll uh, look forward to the next time. Thank you very much, Rick. Okay. Thank you to your listeners, too. Thank you much. Take care. Have a good day. Bye-bye. You, too. Bye now.